scripture this morning was not Jordan Graves, as indicated in our program, but Jordan Pugh. Now, it was supposed to have been Jordan Graves, but he's not here this morning. So I thought the best thing to do is ask another Jordan. And so it was Jordan Pugh, J-O-R-D-A-N, who uh, read the scripture so eloquently this morning. There also is another change in that program, and that is the message this morning. Really, uh, you don't have to pay a whole lot of attention to the background this morning because I'm not speaking today on the subject that's listed in the program because this was one of those weeks where things transpired in our nation that preachers feel compelled to change the message. What began as a week of celebrating our nation's independence ended in a week of much division and a week filled with danger and a week filled with death. And that is, of course, a great concern to those of us who gather in this room. As Christians, we certainly believe in love of brethren and love for our fellow man. As Christians, we desire, we want peace. I know that I'm speaking to people this morning, those gathered in this room who are indeed the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so the message that I'm bringing this morning is just a message to reinforce who we are and how we can leave this place and have a positive impact on our communities and beyond to help our citizenry heal from the wounds that have been inflicted upon it, not just this past week, but for a long time. And of course, we can do that in a special way because we are the citizens of a higher and nobler kingdom, aren't we? We are children of God. We are Christians. This past Wednesday night, I had the pleasure of being in Huntington, Tennessee to speak on a, a summer series. And Brother Dan Winkler is the preacher for the Huntington Church, and all of us here love and respect Brother Dan. He called me Wednesday morning, and he said, uh, he said, Diane, his wife, said she's gone to camp with our granddaughters. He said, but come up a little bit early, and he said, uh, I won't prepare you a meal, but I'll take you out to eat. And so we went to a barbecue place to eat before the service, and we did something that he and I both thoroughly enjoyed. We talked about his dad. <laughs> and his dad, Brother Wendell Winkler, was a great influence upon my life and the life of many preachers. Many of our brethren were greatly influenced by Brother Wendell Winkler. I relayed something to Brother Dan on that occasion, how that Brother Winkler helped to me in one particular instance. I called him because I needed some help. I was going through a particularly difficult time and some things were happening beyond this congregation that was putting Forest Hill and Memphis School of Preaching in a negative light and some of us were being directly targeted and I went to Brother Winkler because of his stature, because of his wisdom. Brother Winkler said, Barry, no matter what situation we ever find ourselves, we must always be Christians. We've got to be Christians. So no matter what happens in this world around us, we have it incumbent upon us to always be Christians. And so I would title the message this morning, Be a Christian. Open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 4, and let's study the first three verses of Ephesians chapter 4. And I believe if each one of us will take this message to heart, 
we will continue to keep our congregation, our congregation a place of love and peace and unity, and we can also help the world around us. What Paul does in Ephesians 4 is move from what has largely been an exhortation on doctrine now to duty. First three chapters of Ephesians, primarily what we call doctrine, now we go to duty. And listen to what he says. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Such noble words written by inspiration. Three primary points I want us to develop from these three verses. And each point will come from one of these verses. Here's the first point. Let us as Christians remember our calling. Verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. There was a lady in my hometown by the name of Bobby Sanders. Mrs. Sanders was married to, to a gentleman who was the division manager of the plant where my dad was employed. My dad was personnel manager for three plants located in the town of Stevenson, Alabama. Those three plants located in that town had a plant manager, and Mr. Sanders was the division manager. My mother became very close to Mrs. Sanders, and I remember on one occasion, Mrs. Sanders said this, every morning when my children leave for school, I say this to them, remember your father because of his position in this town. What was she saying? Your father is respected. He is a businessman. He is held in high esteem by many. And as your children, you reflect upon him. And so she would say, when you go to school, you remember your father. You have a respected father. Don't do anything that mars his good name. That's a blessed wife, isn't it? One who admires her husband to that extent that she says to, your, to her children, you behave yourself because you have a dad who is respected, who is honored in this community. As Christians, let us always remember our Father. Let us always remember to whom we belong. Paul said this. He said, I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice as he addresses the Ephesians, and by the way, this is the second time he's reminded them of this. In his salutation and now again in Ephesians 4, he says, I'm the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say, I'm a prisoner because of the hatefulness of men. He doesn't say, I'm a prisoner because I've been so corrupt. No. He said, you know what? I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, there is a sense in which I, as long as I am in the body, I'm going to always be in a prison, and it's called this old world. <laughs> Paul said, I'm the prisoner, but the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul is reminding these brethren in Ephesus that Christianity comes with a cost. Paul says, what I am speaking to you, I have demonstrated. I am writing this letter from prison. Why? Not because I've wronged anybody, but because I belong to Jesus the Christ. Now, is there a cost connected to Christianity? Our Lord said there is. Let's return to the Gospel of Luke. And notice beginning in verse 28, 
the words of our Lord Jesus. He said, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat anything. Even though there are numerous blessings, untold blessings that are found in Jesus Christ, Jesus still warns ahead of time there is a cost involved in Christianity. Did Paul understand that? I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Yes, he understood that. And so it should not be surprising to the Christian that he's going to have to pay a price for following Jesus. Jesus himself reminds us that there would be a cost in following him. For he reminded his disciples that the servant of the Lord is not greater than the Lord himself. Jesus said, if I have had to suffer... If I've had to pay a price, likewise, you will have to do the same. And so in John 15, 20, remember the word that I said unto you. Jesus said, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Now, I want to tell you this. God is interested in justice he is interested in fairness. He is interested in equity. In fact, uh, justice and judgment are the habitation of his throne, Psalm 89, 14. When God looked upon Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden, that was a just world. Everything was just right. But know this, dear friends, when sin entered the picture, fairness exited. All right? Now, as a Christian who belongs to the God of heaven, you and I are interested in justice and judgment, fairness and equity, but we're also going to have to understand something else. Because sin entered the world, this world is not fair. And there are things that happen, even great tragedies, that are unfair. But they happen because of the cruel world in which we live. Now, here's what the Christian must remember. He must remember that vengeance belongs with God, doesn't he? Let's notice from Romans chapter 12, which is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because so much is said there to promote peace and harmony. It's just a beautiful chapter on Christian living. In Romans chapter 12, as this chapter comes to an end, Paul says this in verse 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you live peaceably with all men. But dearly beloved... Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. In the final analysis, what must we do? While seeking for justice and fairness and equity, Sometimes all we can say is, I've got to leave it in the hands of the Lord. I must allow a good and gracious and wise God who always does what is right to have the final say, to render the final verdict and execute the proper justice. And so in facing dark days, difficult days, 
days where people seem to be so divided, we've got to remember that we're Christians. And if we remember that we're Christians, we will remember our calling. You see, I believe Paul very well could have been singing in that prison, victory in Jesus, because he understood that total, complete victory would finally come when Jesus would come. Don't you remember what Paul said to the Thessalonians? That uh, you who are troubled, rest with us. When you see mistreatment, and in that passage, he's talking about mistreatment that comes to those who are in Christ. He says, those of you who are Christians, you rest with us. God understands. God knows what's happening. And one day Jesus will come. And Jesus will do what is right. And he will do that for whom? For us. For his children. So these days, friends, remember your calling. Remember your calling. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'm his prisoner. I know to whom I belong, I will do his will. But let's notice something else we need to remember. We also need to remember our character. Look at verse 2 of our text this morning, Ephesians 4, 2. He says, we need to remember to be lowly and meek. We need to have long-suffering. We need to be forbearing one another with one another and do all these things in love now when that particular lady that I mentioned earlier said what she did to her children about remembering their father how did she expect those children to remember their father by maintaining good character how can you best reflect your father? Remember your character. Character is defined as moral strength, isn't it? When we say somebody has a good reputation, that means he is a person of character. Now let's notice just a moment what Paul said is involved in having a good character. He first of all says something about lowliness. That's humility. The Christian life begins with humility, doesn't it? If indeed we are going to be the children of God, we must first humble ourselves. Even back to the book of Proverbs, as Solomon began to record these Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Respecting God, honoring Him, that's foundational. Here's how Jesus would begin His ministry. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. One can never come to Christ. One can never represent the Christ if he first does not learn humility. Peter said something about being clothed with humility. 1 Peter 5, 5. Isn't it interesting that one finally, finally obeys the gospel and is baptized we say that person has been clothed with Christ. What kind of attitude did it take to get that person to that point? Humility. Humility. And so humility is what, is what puts you and I in the shoes of somebody else. Now, this is a major point. Because you see, when, when there's a lot of, of bitterness and, and division in a society... It's going to be very important for the Christian to do what? To be humble and to try his very best to put himself in the shoes of somebody else. Now that takes us back to Jesus, doesn't it? What did Jesus do? He was made in the likeness of men, Philippians 2.6. He left heaven so he could do what? Put himself in the shoes of people. He put himself in the shoes of of ordinary folks so that according to Hebrews chapter 4 he could be a faithful 
high priest. In Hebrews chapter 4, here's a familiar passage, but I want you to understand it this morning from one particular vantage point. You remember in verse 14 of Hebrews 4, seeing then that we have this great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest, now notice this, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. What does that tell us about Jesus? He put himself in our shoes. Now that's important. Because you see, you may be somebody here this morning who's, who's struggling with something. Most likely, every one of us here this morning, we're struggling with something. <laughs> and as Christians, uh, we are attuned, we're sensitive to, to what God desires for our lives, and we oftentimes say we fall short, and we do. Here's something that I hope and pray will bless you. Did you know whenever we struggle with sin, for example, I'm not talking about the person out here who, who does not at all care what he does and is antagonistic toward God. I'm talking about the one who struggles with temptation and sin. The Bible makes it clear that Jesus is able to get right down in those shoes and understands. Isn't that a comforting thought? When I start thinking about that, I learn I, I, I don't have to impress God anymore. I, I don't have to, to plead with God anymore to, to love me and to care for me and to understand. He's in my shoes. He can comprehend about you and me what the rest of us cannot comprehend about each other. Have you ever noticed that it's always easy to criticize somebody else for doing something that you may be doing as well. <laughs> Jesus, you see, was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin, and therefore that makes him a great high priest. He calls upon us to be humble. Now, what's the point of all of this? If we're followers of Jesus, then it is imperative that you and I look around us and we listen. We hear things sometimes. I don't understand that. What's that person's background that would cause him to say something like that? I don't know. What's that person's perspective? I don't understand. Then you and I have the responsibility of doing what? Getting in the shoes of that person and trying our best to be like Christ, to see something from the, from the perspective of somebody else. That's what Jesus did on our behalf. Jesus, having been part of the creation, he understands us. But to show us he understands us, what did he do? He came down here and walked in our shoes. That's what he did. Well, remember our character. It begins with humility. But then Paul says something else. He says uh, that we need to have meekness. We need to be people who are filled with lowliness and meekness. A word I like better than meekness really is gentleness. I just understand that word better, and it means the same. But I just like to use that word more. I'm more familiar with it. Gentleness. There was a sweet, sweet Christian woman by the name of Hessie Rowe. You never knew her. I'm the only one in this room, I'm sure, that ever knew a lady named Hessie Rowe. But one of the great blessings of my life as a boy is this. I was surrounded by little old ladies. <laughs> I mean, I lived on a street where I was the only little boy on the street. All the others were with the ladies. I guess a widow is a lady, isn't it? <laughs> but I want to tell you something. They, they loved me, and I loved them. <laughs> Miss Hessie Rowe lived right across the street from us. She was a Christian, devout member of the church. And uh, my mother would often take me over to Miss Rowe's house so that she could keep me while my mother was running errands, and there might have been a period of time when my mother was working outside the home, and, and I stayed with Miss Hessie Rowe. 
I remember that wonderful Christian lady who would meet me at the door, her beautiful white hair, a cotton dress and a sweater that she had over her cotton dress, and she would hug me and she was so gentle. She'd take me into the kitchen and she said, Honey, let me, let me get you something to eat. She'd feed breakfast to me. She would then allow me to sit in her lap as she read a story, so gently, so sweet. I felt so secure. And then she would take me into her bedroom. She'd place me on her, her, her bed that was so neatly made, and, and she'd place a blanket over me. She says, now take your nap. Now, I later learned that my nap coordinated with as the world turns. <laughs> She had, you see, she had to get her story in, right? But I mentioned Miss Hesse Rowe to you this morning because she's been gone on to glory for a long, long time, but I can't wait to see her again. My memories of her, a gentle, sweet, kind woman. You know, the Bible says of Moses, he was the meekest man in all the earth. But wait a minute. I still bring to my memory this man Moses who, who came down off Mount Sinai and, and he saw that mad throng, his own brethren, corrupting themselves and he, he took the Ten Commandments, he took those tablets of stone and he, he struck that golden calf. Uh, that's right. He was also a man who could be like our Lord, filled with righteous indignation. But put this passage down. It's in Exodus 18. I want you to read that whole chapter sometime, maybe this week. Learn what Moses did that actually got his father-in-law Jethro concerned. All day long, Moses sat and he listened to the children of Israel as each one that had a complaint would bring it before Moses. I'm sure among the children of Israel there were few that had complaints, right? You know better. And, and his father-in-law, Jethro, saw this. And he said, what you're doing is not good. Now, now, Jethro was right, wasn't he? He says, you're, you're wearing yourself down. You're, you, you know, you're going to have a mental breakdown, an emotional breakdown. You've got you've to get some assistance in this. But I mentioned this passage to you because it shows to us the meekness of the man Moses. Can't you see him sitting there and gently admonishing each one who came before him. That's what a gentle or a meek person does. For example, when someone disagrees with you or you disagree with someone and that person cannot contain himself and his voice gets louder and louder and louder, what do you need to do? Just lower yours by the same level he's raising his, right? Because you're to be gentle. Something else that Paul says not only do we to be humble and gentle, but we are to be a people filled with, with patience. If you notice there in the passage again, we're to be a people who are long-suffering. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because Paul would also speak about love in 1 Corinthians 13, and it suffers long. I'll tell you something that I think you already know. It's hard to change people, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, we spend so much of our time here on earth trying to change people. Brother Mosier knows this to be true. He probably had to teach this to me, but I, I know that I've had younger preachers come to me. I'm trying to change these brethren. Quit trying to change them. God didn't tell you to do that. Why are you so special? You're going to change somebody. When I study the Bible, I learn it's the Word of God that changes people. All I've got to do is just keep preaching it. But yes, it, it's, it's hard to take someone who's living in sin and bring that person to salvation, isn't it? It's hard to take someone who's been filled with error to all of a sudden see truth. It's very difficult to take somebody who's been in darkness to all of a sudden see the light. To go from being filled with hatred to all of a sudden being filled with love. But what keeps the door open? Patience. Endurance. Steadfastness. Patience keeps the door open. Patience keeps the prayers lifted. Patience keeps your interest alive in somebody else. We can do that. 
because we very well could have a mother here today who is the mother of several children. And perhaps most of her children, if not all of them, are faithful to the Lord, save one. Who gets most of her attention in prayers? It's that one that she prays one day will come home, right? She's patient. She's steadfast. She endures. And so does the Christian. Then he says something else. He says, we are to be a people who are, who are forbearing, forbearing one another. That word could be translated tolerance. Now let's understand something about tolerance. Tolerance does not mean I just sit back and say nothing when wrong is being done. That's not what it is. But there is a, a proper way to show tolerance. Actually, it's commanded here. Sometimes tolerance is seen in a negative light. I'll talk about that on down the road in another sermon. But we are to be, in the right way, tolerant. What tolerance does mean is this. If I haven't been listening to somebody else, I'm going to start listening more. Tolerance likewise means that, that I'm not going to judge too quickly in a situation or too harshly. Tolerance likewise means that I'm not going to move too hastily in any situation, particularly if I don't have all the facts involved in something. And so James 1.19, be ye swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I like this translation of that particular verse. Tune in, tone down, and sweeten up. That's a good understanding of James 1.19. Tolerance. Forbearing one another. In what? In love. Now, think about the four previous points that are mentioned there in Ephesians 2, or Ephesians 4.2, and think about that being like a wheel, and these are spokes coming out from a hub. Let's picture this morning that we have four spokes, and they're coming out from this hub. What's the hub? What holds all this together? From what does this emanate forth? Love. Notice the verse again. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in what? In love. And so the character of a Christian is summarized by this particular word, love. And therefore, the one who is humble, who's gentle, who's patient, who's tolerant, has learned the biblical lesson of love. Now, thus far, we've examined two primary points in this message. Be a Christian means remember your calling. Number two, it means remember your character. Here's the third and final point. Being a Christian means remembering your creed. Look at verse 3. We endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How do we maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? Truth. By being a lover of truth, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. What unites all of us who have come together in this assembly this morning? Truth. You see, in this assembly this morning, we have a whole lot of people here who are American citizens. There may be people here that are American citizens from different racial backgrounds, ethnicities, different statuses with regard to finances and things of that nature. We also have gathering here today individuals from outside this country. Some of them have come here to study in our school of preaching. So they come from different nations. But what is it that unites all of us? Truth. Divine truth. If there's going to be unity among God's people, if there's going to be unity in our country and our world, then there's got to be a love and appreciation for what is true which means what is right. And so we remember our creed. Our creed is truth. You see in that passage that I so love in Psalm 89, 14, about how justice and judgment, that's the habitation of God's throne, it goes on to say that mercy and truth shall go before his face. Oh, with God, mercy and truth are joined together. That's beautiful, isn't it? It's a powerful combination, in fact. Mercy, oh, the mercy of God. We revel in it every day. 
but it's based upon His divine truth. We worship in what? Spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. And so to my fellow members here at Forest Hill and to anybody visiting or anybody hears my voice, I want to say something this morning as we bring this message to a close that I, I, I want this to be helpful and know that it comes from a very sincere heart. As Christians, we're going to have to be very, very careful listening to politicians, okay? Listening to politicians, any politician. Because most politicians do this, they pander, all right? Most politicians have a base out there, and what are they doing? They're pandering to that base to get votes, which ultimately perhaps will give them power, all right? One presidential advisor a number of years ago said this, don't ever let a good tragedy go to waste. Hmm. Not only is that someone uninterested in truth, that's also someone very calloused, isn't it? Tell you something else. Not only be on guard in the midst of division and bitterness and hatred in a society, be on guard against activists. Far to the right, far to the right, far to the left, okay? I guess it works this way if I'm... Be on guard against activists. Seriously, activists can oftentimes be anarchists. They're more about disrupting the peace than bringing people together. And I know this, not interested in truth. And thirdly, be aware of news outlets. Be aware of the media. Because the media oftentimes will sensationalize a story to get good ratings. They're not really interested in truth. They're not really interested in true, genuine peace and bringing people together. Christians, we've got to be on guard about that, and we need to tell our neighbors. We need to tell our neighbors. And so I'm reminded in John 8, 32, that Jesus said it is truth that sets us free. Always has been. We're set free from the bondage of sin through God's particular truth. Some years ago, and I alluded to this earlier, there was a yellow rag that indicted a lot of us here and brethren throughout the country. And that paper has as its heading this, loving truth and hating error. I can appreciate anyone who loves biblical doctrinal truth, but I also say this, every Christian also wants to tell the truth about somebody else. We are to love all truth. And therefore, I don't want to be involved in or interested in spreading something about others that may be a lie. And I know you don't as well. And so this morning, we're talking about who we are in light of darkness, in light of division, in light of fear, in light of hatefulness and hatred. We are Christians. And if anybody is going to have a positive influence upon our communities and the world, it's us. But being a Christian means we remember our calling. It means we remember our character. It means that we remember our creed, what it is that brings us together, whatever it is that unites us. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, I plead with you to become a Christian. You need to be a Christian. And you can be a Christian by submitting yourself to God's divine truth which teaches us that to become a Christian, one must be a penitent believer who confesses Jesus and is baptized. One is baptized is to be baptized into Christ by his authority, and it's for the remission of sins. And this baptism that puts you into him puts you into his church, and that's a beautiful place to be, a secure place to be. It's where you want to be. It's where I want to be. I think most here want to be in this place, and we're inviting others to come and be, be part of that. That's where you need to be this morning, in Christ, in his church. And we invite you to do that. That's, that invitation is open to all who would repent and obey. And maybe you're here this morning, you're struggling as a Christian. You're a child of God. You've been forgiven of your past sins, but you're, you're still struggling. That's all right. 
But you keep praying. You keep drawing closer to God. Be a Christian. And if you are a child of God who says, you know, I need, I need the prayers of my brethren, then we'll pray for you this morning. You see, here in this place, we're here to help each other. We're here to demonstrate love for one another. We're here to forgive. We're here to restore. That's why we exist. The invitation is yours. It's an invitation extended by our Lord. You're subject to it this morning. Won't you come while together we stand and sing?